Welcome back to Natural Language Processing. Now we're going to continue our uh, topic on information extraction by focusing on relation extraction. So what is relation extraction? Well, if we have entities, we can often be interested in the links between those entities. For example, a certain person works for a certain company or a certain company manufactures a certain product or a certain company is located at a certain location and so on. So one of the earliest uh, research uh, challenges that were done in this area is called MUC. MUC stands for Message Understanding Conference. It had multiple iterations in the 90s and early 2000s. So it was an annual competition and uh, it was about extracting events from news stories. So the events were things like terrorist events, joint ventures, management changes and so on. There was a different scenario pretty much every year. So the evaluation metrics were things like precision and recall and F measure and filling out the slots of the different fields. So here's an example of a mock story. Uh, this is from the Mach 5 English Joint Ventures Tasks. Uh, so it uh, talks about Bridgestone Sports Corporation said Friday that it has set up a joint venture in Taiwan with a local concern and a Japanese trading house to produce golf clubs to be shipped to Japan. So in this particular implementation of the Mach challenge, uh, the participants were given a set of articles like those and they had to identify the companies that were uh, having a joint venture and then fill in a set of slots about the particular event. So this slide is a little bit difficult to read, but if you look at it in more detail, you'll see that it includes things like the name of the company that is uh, initiating the joint venture, the name of the partner company, the location of the joint venture, uh, and the date that it is effective, and so on. So this is the expected output. And as I mentioned before, systems were evaluated based on how often they correctly identified uh, the slots and their, their values. Uh, so other examples of information in relation extraction are things like job announcements. So for job announcements, we want to find out things like the location of the job, the title of the job, starting date, possibly the list of qualifications, the starting salary. Seminar announcements, we're interested in filling out slots like time, the title, the location, the speaker. For medical papers, we want to be able to extract things like the drug, the disease, a gene or protein, a cell line, a species or a substance. So filling the templates. So some of the fields have to be filled by text from the document. So essentially extracting an entire string of text, for example, the name of a company or the name of a gene directly from the document. Others can be predefined values. For example, whether a certain attempt was successful or not like a successful merger or whether the merger was unsuccessful. Some fields allow for just one value, some allow for multiple values, and so on. So what are the common approaches that are used in information extraction and specifically relation extraction? Well, information extraction is viewed as a sequence labeling problem and people use HMMs. They can also use patterns, for example, regular expressions. So regular expressions is something that comes up a lot in natural language processing, so I would like to spend a little bit of time to talk about it here. I will do this in the next set of slides. People also use features. For example, the capitalization of the words. Is it uh, in caps initial or all caps? Does it contain digits? What kind of suffixes it contains? What kind of punctuation it contains? And so on. So here's some regular expressions that are used in the pro programming language. There are similar expressions in other common languages like Java and Python. So, the caret, for example, in Pro is used to match the beginning of a string. Uh, it's also, if it's used within a, a set of square brackets, it means the complement of the rest of the symbols mentioned in there. For example, if you want to find um, anything that is not the letter A, you would include it in a pair of square brackets, caret A. The door sign matches the end of a string. The period matches any character in a string except for a new line character. Uh, the star matches zero or more occurrences of the same symbol, plus matches one or more occurrences, question mark matches zero or one occurrences. The vertical bar allows you to search for alternatives. For example, you, you may be looking for megahertz or gigahertz as a property of a computer, and you would say something like megahertz, vertical bar, uh, gigahertz. 
Uh, you can also do things like grouping and memory, so essentially uh, being able to replace uh, entire sequences of characters. A star means zero or more occurrences of something. A curly brace and then a number, a closing curly brace means that you want exactly m occurrences of that thing. Uh, if you put in the curly braces something like m comma, where m is a number, you're looking for at least that many occurrences of A. If you put two numbers separated with a comma, you are looking for at least m, but at most n occurrences of that particular symbol. And there are some special symbols that match things like new lines, tabs, carriage returns, uh, any letter, any number, uh, anything that is not a letter, anything that is not a number. Backslash B matches the word boundary, backslash capital B matches anything that is not a word boundary. And you can also have ranges of things. For example, if you say uh, left square bracket A dash B, closing the square bracket, that would tell you that you can match any character from A to B inclusive. And if you have A to Z, that would match any character in the alphabet as long as it is in lowercase. If you want to match any character in the alphabet that is either lowercase or uppercase, you will need to say something like left brace uh, little a dash little z followed by capital A dash capital Z followed by a closing square bracket. Uh, in the section on uh, regular expressions and uh, automata, you will uh, find out more about the way that those expressions are used and computed. So here's some patterns that are used in information extraction. So for example, to identify prices, something like $14,000. You can use the expression that says, look for the special symbol dollar sign, followed by either a zero or one or two or anything up to nine or the, the symbol comma, repeated as many times as necessary, followed by any sequence uh, that starts with the period and then includes uh, exactly two occurrences of the digits from zero to nine. So this regular expression is going to match $14,000 like written as above. It will also match $14,000 without the comma but it's not going to match $14,000 period and then three digits. Uh, so the question mark at the end of the regular expression just tells you that the uh, fractional portion is optional. So here's an example of a regular expression that matches a date in the format year, month, day. So something like this, caret for beginning of string, then either 19 or 20 for the 20th and 21st century respectively, then followed by any two digits followed by um, you know, a hyphen, followed by a two-digit sequence for the month, but it has to be in a specific format so that only valid months are acceptable. And then finally, uh, we have uh, the last two digits that correspond to all the days of the month. So, so anywhere from 0, 01 to 31. Now, this expression obviously doesn't have enough information to determine that we have uh, only uh, 28 days or 29 days in February, but 31 days in May and July, but at least it does a good job uh, with what it has. Here's an example of a regular expression that matches email addresses, something like this. As you can see, it's a fairly sophisticated expression. Uh, important things are that it has to include uh, an at sign somewhere, and then at the end it has to have an extension that starts with a period, and then it has anywhere from two to four characters to cover things like dot us, dot com, dot info, and so on. I think that nowadays there are uh, domains that have more than four characters, so this expression would obviously need to be revised. Uh, to match a person, we can include things like, for example, sequence of two words that such that the first one starts with a capital letter and the second one starts with a capital letter. Obviously, this is not going to match all the persons. There are people who have three names and one name and so on. It's also possible to come up with patterns that include some HTML code so that they can be used to scrape websites, for example, to extract price information from websites like Amazon and eBay. It can also include part of speech information. So for example, you may be looking for uh, any noun followed by any adjective and so on. And it can also include WordNet information. For example, you may be searching for uh, a sequence uh, so that the second word in the sequence is something that belongs to the organization subtree of WordNet. So that would include things like company and newspaper and so on. So here's a simple uh, sample input format for named entity recognition. Uh, this is a parsed sentence from the Pantry Bank. 
uh, Rudolf Agnew, 55 years old and former chairman of Consolidated Goldfields PLC, was named a non-executive director of this British industrial conglomerate. So the example output that I'm going to show you is in the so-called IOB format. This is a very common format in many different natural language processing tasks, including uh, uh, part of speech tagging, uh, named entity recognition, semantical labeling, and so on. So what does IOB stands for? It stands that for the fact that every word in the sequence can be labeled as either O, which stands for other, or it can be a B followed by some label, or an I followed by the same label. B stands for beginning of the label, and I stands for inside. So let's look at this example here. The first named entity here is Rudolf Agnew. Uh, the first word of it is labeled as B person, because it's the beginning of a person. The next one is labeled as I person, because it's part of the person, but it's not the beginning. The next thing is a comma, which is labeled as a O, because it's not anything that we're interested in. Further down, we have Consolidated Gold Fields PLC, which is a company name. Uh, as you can see, the word consolidated is labeled with a beginning symbol for organization, and then the rest of the words in that organization, Gold Fields and PLC, are all labeled as I-Org. Now, you can imagine that it's possible to perform name entity recognition in two steps. In the first step, we recognize that Consolidated Gold Fields PLC is some sort of named entity, and then we can use any standard classification method to determine uh, what specific type of named entity it is. So how do we evaluate template-based information extraction? Well, it's very straightforward. For each test document, let's say each news story or each scientific paper, we figure out, first of all, how many correct template extractions happen. So for example, if the task is to identify mergers between companies and we're given a document that doesn't have any such mergers, then the correct number of template extractions is zero. If we end up with more than zero, that means that we have made a mistake. Now, the next thing is to figure out how many slot and value pairs were extracted for any of the different templates. So for the case of management succession, for example, in Mock, you can have the name of the person uh, who's uh, being replaced in the organization and the name of the person who's replacing that previous person. So if you get both of those correctly, you would get two points. If you miss one of them, you would only get half of the points. And finally, you want to get the number of extracted slot value pairs that are actually correct, not just extracted. So what about the relation extraction? There are many different relations that exist in text. For example, relation between two people. Uh, that can be parent of, or married to, or managers. You can have relations between person and an organization. For example, a person can work for a certain organization. And you can also have uh, relations between two different organizations. For example, organization A is part of organization B. You can also have organization location relations. Uh, for example, such and such organization is headquartered at such and such location. So this leads me to another evaluation that was used in the early 2000s, uh, mostly following MUC. It's the so-called ACE evaluation for automatic con content extraction evaluation. Uh, the task was to use a set of newspaper articles from 2002 and to identify all the entities that belong to the following categories, person, organization, facility, location, and geopolitical entity, and also to identify all the relations between those entities, for example, things like role, part, located, near, and social. So relation extraction in general is a very important core NLP task. It's used for building knowledge bases for question answering and so on. Its input is uh, a sentence, for example, Mazda North American Operations is headquartered in Irvine, California. And the output is supposed to be uh, a tuple that consists of the organization, in this case, Mazda North American Operations, a location, in this case, Irvine, California, and then a label for the relation, specifically in this example, is headquartered in. So in the predicate form, this is just a tuple is headquartered in with the first argument Mazda North American Operations and the second argument the city of Irvine, California. Uh, and as you can see, uh, this relation uh, is very common. There are many organizations and each organization can have a specific uh, location for their headquarters. So it's very easy to build databases and use standard database techniques for querying those databases once 
we have performed all the information extraction and relation extraction steps. Okay, so the different techniques that I use for relation extraction, some of them involve using patterns, for example, regular expressions and gazetteers, and others fall in the usual categories of supervised learning and semi-supervised learning. We're going to look at some examples of semi-supervised learning in a minute. But let's first look at some examples of extracting relations, specifically is our relations using uh, patterns. So this example comes from a paper by Marty Hurst from the 90s. So she says that to extract is our relations, you have to find patterns that say something like this, x and other y, or x or other y. Y such as x, y including x, y especially x, where y is the more general category and x is the less general category. So for example, evolutionary relationships between the platypus and other mammals. So in this case, the expression and other gives us a hint that platypus is X and mammal is Y, and more specifically that platypus is a kind of mammal. Now, what about supervised relation extraction? Well, in this case, we want to look for sentences that have two entities that we know are part of the target relation, and then look at the other words in the sentence, especially the ones between the two entities, and build a classifier that looks for those clue words between the target words and help us classify the entire tuple. So here's an example. In English, we have a sentence like, Beethoven was born in December 1717, Bonn. Uh, so was born is the expression that links together the two entities, Beethoven and 1770. There are other ways to express the same relation, however. So for example, born in Bonn in 1770, comma, Beethoven, dot, dot, dot. Or after his birth on December 16, 1770, Beethoven grew up in a musical family. You can see that it's not always the case that the clue phrase, like in this case, born and birth, have to appear uh, between uh, the two words that we're trying to link. They can appear outside of them, but usually they appear somewhere nearby. Here's one more example, Ludwig van Beethoven, uh, left parenthesis 1770, 1827, which are the, his birth year and year of death. So this is another expression that we may want to look for to find more instances of the relation person was born in a certain year. Here's one more example. While this evidence supports the case for 16 December 1770 as Beethoven's date of birth, Again, we have date of birth here as the clue phrase. It turns out that those techniques can be used in non-English languages as well. So here's just a few examples from Spanish and German. In German, we have uh, Ludwig van Beethoven wurde am 17 December in Bonn getauft. So in this case, wurde getauft is the expression that indicates that he was born on that particular date. And then here we have also wurde geboren. Uh, which is another way to say the same thing. Uh, and we have also Der Geburtstag, or the birth date of Ludwig van Beethoven. And again, it connects uh, the name of the person with the year. The Spanish examples, uh, nació in Spanish means was born. So again, it connects the named entity of person with the named entity for the uh, time. Or we can have nacido and bon. Nacido means born in Bonn 1770, Beethoven dot dot dot. Or Ludwig van Beethoven nace in December. Uh, nace in this case means is born in December of 1770. So the third method for relation extraction is semi supervised. In that example, uh, we have uh, some training data. Uh, for example, some seed expressions like Beethoven was born in December 1770 in Bonn. Now we know that this sentence represents a valid instance of the tuple X was born in year Y. So the next thing that we need to figure out is what other sentences contain both Beethoven and 1770. So there are probably many different ways in which we can express the relation between those two. But we expect that some of the words that appear nearby uh, Beethoven and 1770 are the ones that carry the meaning of the relation. So maybe we're going to learn that birth date is such an example. Then we're going to start looking for expressions that appear nearby, like birth date. And then we're going to use those uh, expressions now to find other instances containing other people and their birth dates uh, in other sentences in other documents. 
Okay, so now let's look at the different ways in which we can evaluate relation extraction. Well, relation extraction is essentially a classification task. So we want to measure things like precision, which is the number of correctly extracted relations divided by the number of O extracted relation, relations. And recall, which is the number of correctly extracted relations divided by all the existing relations. And you can also combine the two into F1 measure, which is the harmonic mean of precision and recall. Now, all those metrics work well if we have uh, annotated data. But if there is no annotated data, it's no, not possible to measure recall because we don't know what we're missing. We can only measure precision. Okay, so to conclude, uh, probabilistic NLP is uh, very important. Uh, uh, one of the most uh, crucial examples of probabilistic NLP in action is part of speech tagging using hidden Markov models. And uh, information extraction also uses the same kind of techniques for uh, uh, probabilistic natural language processing. Uh, there's one more technique that is using information extraction called conditional random fields, which we did not cover. Uh, and you can look it up uh, in the textbook. So this concludes the section on information extraction. Thank you for your attention.